first off, I want to say welcome to my home office. Uh, I know a lot of you guys probably haven't visited my house, and uh, this is definitely the longest my hair has been in 20 years. So uh, the last time it was this long was right before I joined the Marine Corps in 1999. So um, ever since then, it's been a, hair, a haircut every week while I was in and every two weeks once I got out. So uh, it's, uh, it's been a challenging time. So I appreciate everybody taking some time on a Thursday night and uh, hopefully learning a, a short amount, a small amount in the next 30 minutes about load calcs for building permits. It's been a huge topic here in Massachusetts and throughout the country. Um, they're starting to enforce uh, the fact that you do need a load calc when you pull a building permit. It's been code for a long time. It's been the International Residential Code at least since 2009. That's the oldest copy I have, uh, but that, that's been around for a while. Uh, in, in Section 1401, it says you have to size equipment in accordance with ACA Manual S based on loads calculated with Manual J. All right, so it should be Manual J version 8 approved software. Um, I'll show you those available uh, through ACA at the end of the presentation here. Um, so you have an idea of where to go if you don't already do it. But I know you're busy. I appreciate you taking the time. This is what it means for you, though. If you're uh, in distribution or you're a contractor, um, if these contractors are pulling permits, you're on the hook for a load calc, you got to size it correctly. So I'm going to talk about what the building inspectors are actually checking. Uh, well, the good ones. Some of them may not know and just take the piece of paper and call it a day, right? Um, some of them actually know what they're looking at, and we're going to want to make sure that uh, you follow through and give them the details they're looking for. So, picture of my home. It's an old house in Upton, Massachusetts. Uh, you'll see on the right-hand side is an uh, uh, actual uh, layout right off of the uh, town assessor's website, right? So, if you don't have the floor plans for a house, even on a retrofit, it's really easy to utilize the building department and just go down there and get the town card. You can actually search it on Google these days. It's really, really simple. I like to do this prior to a sales call and I would draw in all the interior walls as far as sizes of rooms. Because really, this is the layout. If you have multiple floors like this house, I'd have a couple copies. Really, really simple. Um, if you don't have access to that or you can't get it quickly, I believe if the house has been sold in the last few years, it's kind of creepy. You can go on Zillow or Realtor.com, and there's probably a picture of the layout of the home. That's my house. Um, not that you guys know exactly where these rooms fall here, but um, you can probably tell which one's my bedroom and which one's my daughter's bedroom here. Okay, So it's all over the internet. It's open, very, very simple to find, and this will save you a ton of time when you do site survey. In fact, a lot of these even have uh, pictures of the windows, doors, all of it's already in there. You just got to make the notes as to what they are, all right? But the key is you give the inspector uh, a picture of the layout. So some software does this for you as you start to actually draw out the rooms. Some software does not. Some of it's uh, more of a menu style or a worksheet style. And a lot of code inspectors have a tough time following those details and verifying. So if you give them this layout, this floor plan, it's a lot easier for them to verify the load calc with outside walls and doors and windows and ceilings, right? So uh, that's the easy part, is just getting the floor plan. The rest of it is details that you don't have a choice on, uh, like location and design conditions. You have to use ACA Manual J version 8, 99% or 1% design uh, for outdoor conditions. So you can see on my screen, these are the heating and cooling outdoor design conditions in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. That's where I work the most. Um, you'll see everything from negative 2 out in Greenfield, Mass, all the way up to uh, 88 degrees in cooling for uh, Lowell. All right. So uh, you have to use those design conditions. You can't uh, pick an extreme temperature or design for the worst day of the year. This is 99% of the year. It's that temperature or warmer in heating. Right. So as an example, in Greenfield, if you add up all of the hours of the year that it's less than negative 2 out, trust me, it gets there. I've, I've visited Greenfield. It's cold. All right, but uh, it's only going to add up to 3.65 days, 1% of the year. We can't size a system for a more extreme temperature, oversize it for that extra half of a percent a year or something. Um, and even in my house, I have an old one pipe steam boiler. When it's below the design conditions, that thing runs constantly and it barely keeps 68. All right, but it's pretty comfortable compared to negative 10 outside that day. So really important, you have to use the design temps. We can't oversize based on temps. Also inside, and this is always a fun conversation with the homeowner, right? 
Um, you have to size to 75 degree dry bulb in cooling and 50% relative humidity. There's no leeway. All right, you can't go down to 70 or 68 because the homeowner wants a refrigerator. It doesn't work that way. All right. Um, also in heating, it's 70 degrees, but you're allowed to go plus or minus two inside. Okay. And I just want to cover why these indoor design temps, why are they fixed? Okay. Uh, because not everybody is always comfortable at the same temperature. We all know this and we've all dealt with this, uh, with a newly installed system that somebody's not happy with. And what I have to say is every time I brought this up early in the sales process and explained it to homeowners, they understand and I don't get that follow up uh, call. I set the expectations. Okay. Um, and also most of them don't know what 50% relative humidity feels like in cooling. Okay. That's another thing. If you drive that temperature down too low, that is really going to start to drive the humidity up because you can only hold so much water in that glass, right? You guys can think of a glass as being the dry bulb temperature and how much water is in that glass being the relative humidity. If you start to make that glass smaller by cooling the air, it can only hold so much water. Ideally, we're removing water at the same rate. We're removing moisture, latent capacity, but it doesn't always happen. Sometimes it cools faster than it removes moisture. And then we start getting condensation on our devices and all these other problems and it causes indoor air quality problems. So that's one of the main reasons for 50%. The other main reason is it actually falls into the middle of the psychrometric comfort zone. All right. So you guys can see here, I'm going to plot this out. I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining psychrometrics. I don't want to put everybody to sleep at 6, 6, 630 here. All right. But I do want to tell you this allows room for drift. Okay. So as an example, in cooling, if we set our temperature for 75 degrees and we maintain 50% relative humidity, that's in the middle of the comfort zone, which covers the majority of the United States for comfort, all right, for people. Now, if it's mild temperatures outside and we're cooling too fast, we might have to turn the temperature down to, let's say, 73 to feel comfortable, but it would be 50% relative humidity or 55% relative humidity. If it can't keep up and it's, it's, the temperature starts to rise in the house because it's 100 out, right, and it's way above design temps, then it might be 77, 78 in here, but it might be 45% relative humidity. And now we're still comfortable because we're in the comfort zone. And sometimes I wish we took numbers off those thermostats. Let me tell you, um, that's always been a problem. So uh, the, the key is, is it working or are you comfortable? That's the key. Um, same thing in heating. Heating actually gives you a little more leeway. In the code, you're allowed to go plus or minus two degrees. So the highest could be 72 inside, the lowest is 68, okay? And in the heating uh, comfort zone, oh, that's interesting. Looks like I just opened up a picture here by accident. I apologize. Really messing with everybody. So in the middle of the heating comfort zone, we actually, if we can't keep up, we can feel warmer by adding relative humidity, right? So if we can't keep up and it's 65, 66 in the house, if we turn a humidifier on, it'll start to feel warmer, all right? Or if we don't and it continues to dry the air out, it'll feel colder and we have to keep turning that temperature up, okay? so. Humidity is really what impacts human comfort, and that's what we're trying to control and allow room for drift. So that's why those indoor design conditions, and I know you don't want to get too technical when it comes to, uh, to homeowners, right? You want to explain them with, with some, um, you know, what we used in the military used to call Barney style uh, uh, and, and break it down a little bit, um, but it's really important to set the expectation before the installation, all right? So I did get a couple of questions here. I just want to make sure I cover everything. Um, I'm having a tough time seeing them. So let me just shrink it down for a second. Uh, I apologize if you don't have audio. Hopefully everybody can still hear me. Um, you should uh, click join with audio if you use the computer. Awesome, Don, good to see that. Um, and looks like they didn't have a mic, so no big deal. You can uh, chime, in with the, chime in with your, um, your, uh, your chat here if you have any other questions. All right, so moving on to the presentation. One thing I always forgot was the direction of north. I always did the entire site survey and forgot which way north was. Luckily, these days we have Google. Really, really easy. Google Maps, Google the address. It always pops up with the direction of north being up. So that way you can verify afterwards. This is really important when it comes to direction of windows, walls, doors, right? There's a different 
amount of heat that's being added to that window if it's facing south or southwest instead of north when it's during peak demand, right? When it's during 4 or 5 p.m. In the, in the heat of summer. So really important you get the directions right. And, and, and the direction of that device, let's say, or fenestration is going to be verified by the code inspector because that can drastically change the size of your equipment. What I don't want to see is people hit click on the software and just clicking north until you get the highest number. Don't do that. All right. That's not what that, 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 that indicator is for. Okay. I know we've all tried it. Uh, not anymore. All right. So moving on. Fenestration is another one that impacts the load a lot. And it's very easy for a code inspector to verify these numbers. All right. So when you're looking at windows and doors, it's obviously only windows and doors that go outside to unconditioned space. So uh, you need to identify the framing of the window. Is it metal, wood, vinyl, insulated fiberglass? Usually it's pretty easy to tell that. What's harder to tell these days is glass type. Um, usually it's really easy to see how many panes are in the window, right? Single pane, double pane, um, and if it's operable. Uh, but it's a little hard to tell if it's low E or uh, heat absorbing or if there's argon filled. You're not going to be able to figure that out, I don't think, unless you have the NFRC number. And if you didn't know, in the window jam, a lot of them have the NFRC sticker on the inside of the window jam. You can go to nfrc.org, type in that number, and it'll give you all the specs of the windows. Uh, I wouldn't probably look in the jam of every single window. Chances are, like at my house, when the windows were replaced, we used the same type of window all the way around. It's very rare that you have four or five different types of windows in a house. Um, I have seen it, but it's very rare. All right. Um, also, don't omit things like exterior bug screens. Is it a full bug screen or just a half a bug screen? Because that does deflect the sunlight when it's coming in, depending on which way that's facing during the day. All right. So those types of things add up. And also, don't omit internal shading um, unless you are out in the middle of the country and there is no shading on the windows. Obviously, this is a picture of my office before uh, we moved in. You can see right through that window to my neighbor's house. Actually, you might be able to see my neighbor's house on the, on the, on the camera today. Um, but if, um, if I just put conditions like this with no shading, that's obviously not real in my house. Um, when you're doing a house that's, that's already being lived in and you're walking through to Insight Survey, chances are they're going to have the drapes up. They're going to have the windows, uh, the blinds uh, half drawn, right? Whatever the conditions are is what you should enter on the site survey, okay? Um, don't omit them. Don't say there's zero because there needs to be some. Now, if this is new construction, you don't know what they are. The standard is medium shade blinds, half drawn, right, um, and uh, at a 45 degree angle. That way, uh, it gives you kind of a standard to work off of. And drapes obviously would be heavier and deflect more sun, so you get less heat gain. Um, but if you have something open, there's a little bit more heat gain. So really important. Don't omit shading or bug screens. Okay. Um, insulation is another one that I see a lot of guys guess at. It's really easy if you measure the depth of the insulation, you know what you're looking at. So obviously that's some blown in cellulose in my old 1880 Victorian upstairs. All right. For new construction homes, typically in the Northeast here, you're looking at probably R30 or R32, depending on which state you're working in and what zone you fall in. Um, obviously that's the standard for the new IECC that's been implemented a couple years ago for 2015 IECC. Um, that's going to be updated and it's most likely going to go as high as R40, okay? Um, but if it's a retrofit, it's the insulation that you actually see up in the attic or the uh, unconditioned floor in the basement or the walls in the basement, right? Or wherever goes outside. So in this case, I would measure that depth and I would multiply it by the uh, inch R factor, right, for cellulose or fiberglass or whatever that is. It's really, really easy to figure out as long as you measure it. That unfortunately means you got to at least poke your head up there. I know it kind of stinks when it's 150 up there sometimes. All right. Also, another big one that people really try to, uh, I don't know, add to the load for no reason is internal gains. And this is something that code inspectors really harp on. So when people usually think internal gains, they think uh, people, right? Uh, the, the number of people in the load calc is always the number of bedrooms plus one. And that's because they assume there's two people in the master bedroom, all right? Um, people make up a really small amount to the load. Um, also, too, you can count for a full-time guest. Like if you have elderly uh, living in a, in a room that's not normally a bedroom, you can count the elderly because they're living there full-time, all right? Um, or, or other occupants. Uh, but block load amounts is really what we typically see people use. Um, if you're using a block load amount, the standard that a lot of people use is actually probably too low. That's 1,200 BTUs. 
that's typically what you would put in the kitchen for just a refrigerator and a range, okay? That's option one if you're using a lot of software. Software uses options one, two, and three. 1200 BTUs is option one. Option two is where you would see most homes if you're doing a block load or you're doing a large kitchen where you would put that. That would be the refrigerator, a range with a vented hood, dishwasher, a washer, and a vented dryer. There's no adjustment for an unvented dryer. You have to vent them. And then uh, standard electronic equipment and lighting that would be on at 5 o'clock when there's peak load. Okay, um, Standard meaning it's not those... Uh, those crazy, crazy halogen uh, can lights or something like that. There's adjustments for those in Manual J. Okay, uh, If you go above the 2400 threshold here, that's where most code inspectors want uh, proof of those adjustments. But that third option is 3400 BTUs to account for a couple of refrigerators um, and the same standard that's in uh, the option number two. All right, But I've seen internal gains in some houses as high as seven eight thousand btus all right if those lights are going to be on at five o'clock you would count them and you would add them to the room um that that they're actually on in don't forget things like ceiling fans or not that there's many out there but water beds right or uh televisions that will be on during peak demand or peak load and uh they put off a lot of heat now that's not an led tv but like a you know the old uh the older lcds right they, they actually put off some heat you can feel them um, stereo equipment, uh, you know, it seems like everybody's home office is basically like an IT center these days. So account for those things in those rooms. There's adjustments in Manual J for that, okay? Um, now, another big difference when you talk about Manual J version 8 versus, versus version 7 is the accounting of where the ductwork is, how much it leaks, and what the R value on the duct system is, all right? In the past, in the 1980s and earlier, version 7 did not include this detail. There would just be a percent adjustment, and it was a wild guess. Okay, Now we're actually calculating these loads. It's really important that, um, that you take a look at the location of this and uh, how much it leaks. So if you're doing a duct test, then you would actually have that value. Um, if it's a new duct system, you're going to see on the, on the right-hand side of my screen here, a new duct system has uh, typically notable, when you talk about uh, the standard being less than 4 CFM per 100 square feet that the unit services, that's what the code requirement is. So if you look on the right-hand side, that translates to notable as the option in your software. Extreme would be used if you're doing something like uh, uh, AeroSeal or something like that on your duct system. That's where you're getting it down to single digits, less than 2% of the uh uh, square footage, uh, I'm sorry, uh, CFM 25 per square foot, all right? Uh, that's a really tight duct system. So standard encode is less than 4%, unless all the duct work and the air handler is completely within the building envelope. Then you don't have to do a duct test currently, all right? And that's the case across the country. Uh, but keep in mind, that's probably going to be updated in the 2018 IECC. They're going to require you test all duct work. All right, that is uh, probably going to be promulgated in most states in the next year. So, all right, so I'm going to, I have a couple questions that came in. I want to address them as we go. Um, one from uh, Kevin down in Rhode Island. If you perform a room by room load calc, is there somewhere you can find out the load of the appliances, fans, lights, etc., so you can add it to the specific room? Absolutely, Kevin. If you're doing a room by room load calc, you would actually go in and add internal gains to that room. So if you're using a software like WriteSoft, you would actually right click on that room, go to internal gains, and then you have options in that window. Okay. Um, now, if you don't know what the value needs to be, you probably have to look that up in a copy of Manual J. Okay. Um, a lot of software doesn't tell you the name of it. It just tells you the amount. So it'll say add 800 BTUs per hour or 1,000 BTUs per hour. You got to know what that actually is when you're accounting for it. There's a table in Manual J for that. Ian said, uh, in Massachusetts, most ducts in new constructions are around 2%. Ian, that means you're really doing a great job duct sealing that system, and you're using a really good quality piece of equipment to leak that low. Um, if you're getting that number that low, good on you. It is hard, and I'll tell you, it's been um, I've been teaching duct sealing and duct testing for 
oh boy, 10 years now. And uh, there's a lot of contractors out there that when they first start doing it and, and they see that number, I'll tell you, it's, um, it, it really uh, is hard to get down there. Um, Ian says it's not him. So thanks for being honest, Ian. I was giving you a lot of daps there. All right. So just to get back to the presentation regarding duct work, um, you also need to make sure you identify the insulation of the duct system. All right. So in the 2015 IECC, if you're doing a new duct system, it needs to be insulated to R8 if it's outside the building envelope or in the attic. If you're within the building envelope, you need to insulate to R6 unless it's all within the thermal envelope of the building. All right, then you don't have to insulate it. But here's the thing, if you have air conditioning, I would at least insulate that supply duct. Um, there's just too much of a chance it could get below the dew point of the air under certain conditions. Um, in almost every area except for maybe Arizona, I'd be insulating supply duct no matter where it is. Uh, just personal recommendation. I've seen too many horror stories, okay? Now, like I was talking about before, all of this is calculated using software. I've tried, when I, when I was taught by Hank Rakowski uh, to teach Manual J, I had to do a lot of longhand calculations before he would approve me. Um, and I'll tell you for sure, you cannot do a full Manual J load calc correctly using version 8 without using software, all right? I've tried. Um, so the most popular one out there is WriteSoft. Uh, that's the one I happen to use for the last 15 years or so. I like it because I'm more of an AutoCAD draw the room kind of guy. Um, and then I can use that with the code inspector, right? Because now I have the layout of the, of the, the floor plan, okay? Um, if you're not a, lay, a layout kind of draw it kind of guy, uh, most of these other ones are worksheet style, meaning you list the wall that faces north. This is the window, this is the door. Um, these are the, the different items in that room. This is how many internal gains you got in the kitchen. And then you move on to the next room and you're only doing outside walls and windows and ceilings and floors, all right? Um, I would say the next most popular to do that with is Elite Software. Um, I see that used a lot locally, uh, but that does not give you a printout of the floor plan. So you probably have to have that with your load to make it simple for your, your building inspector, okay? Um, the next most popular I would say is AdTech. That's very similar to Elite. Um, they're very similar in cost, um, and their support is great actually. Um, you know, I have never had a problem with any of those three. The next three on the bottom actually, um, are, are slightly different. Carmel is app-based. You would use it on your iPad. Um, it's just an initial one cost. It's very easy to do block loads with Carmel software. It's a little tougher to do room by room. You basically create the block load and then start pulling all of the items into each room from the block load. So it's a little bit more work. It's a little more cumbersome on your iPad, but it's a much lower cost because once you pay, you own it forever. It's a couple hundred bucks for the app. Um, Avenir is actually a, a a 3D modeling software. It's very expensive. It works very well with some of those uh, realtor 3D modeling uh, softwares that are out there as well as AutoCAD and things like that if you're doing stuff with general contractors and new buildings. Um, I personally have not used Avenir. It's, it's relatively new to the industry on the HVAC side, um, but everybody that has used it loves the printouts because they're giving you 3D printouts of stuff. Okay. And then, of course, the last one on the bottom I saved uh, is actually free to use. It's CoolCalc. You can find it at cool-calc.com. The only time you have to pay is in order to print off a report for code purposes. So you can do the whole load calc, save it. If you never want to print it off, that's fine. You have the load. Really simple. Um, what's nice about CoolCalc is it autofills all of the material types based on the age of the house. So you just have to go in and modify that. And really, the easiest part about it is it uses Google Maps. When you type in the address, as long as it's in a relatively open area, if you're in, if you're deep in the woods, it might actually um, cut out on you, and, and you won't be able to do it. But you can tap out the the floor plan, and it'll actually load in your square footage, and it makes it really simple. Okay, um, so CoolCalc.com, check it out if you're interested. All right, so. Just to let you guys know, um, I do have a site survey form that's available. If you signed up for this webinar, you most likely got a welcome email that has a bunch of resources in there. One of them is the load calc survey sheet, so you don't miss anything when you're out there doing load calcs. There's a lot more to site survey than just the couple topics I covered today. This is a front and back sheet here. So there's a lot of information. If you've never done a site survey and you want to know the basics, I teach that. Um, if you're, don't, this is like basically the class you want to teach before you ever learn software. All right, so this is, what the inputs need to be before you put it in. Um, also, when you have the load calc, I also teach manual S, which means 
how big or small the system has to be based on the load. And then of course, when you turn that over to duct design, in this class, we also walk through how to design and lay out a duct system using trunk and branch, okay? Um, so I can definitely tell you, everybody that comes out of this class is more confident with the site survey process, sizing procedures for all residential equipment, and how to do duct design. It's pretty low cost. Um, I used to teach this in person, but obviously with the COVID-19 issue, can't be doing that in person right now. So I recorded all of it in small sections with PDF downloads that make it really easy for you to learn. Um, those five resources I talked about uh, when you signed up, you should have got them. If you didn't, if you go to my blog or you send any of your teammates to my blog, um, if they subscribe, the first welcome email con confirming your email address will be links to all of these resources. One of them is a book, an ebook that I wrote on how to design ductwork for low static air handlers, right? For all the different mini split style concealed ducted air handlers out there with low static. I also give everybody my templates I used to use for maintenance contracts. A breakdown of all the rules of duct design, that load calc survey form I just talked about, and uh, a little design scorecard I used to keep track of all the design pieces that I need in order to continue down the process. So the load, the manual S information, and then the basics I need for, for uh, uh, duct design. I found myself bouncing around a lot in the past, if that makes sense. Okay, So if you want to pass this, this is being recorded, if you want to pass this along, let your, uh, let your companies know that uh, we recorded it and I'm posting it on YouTube. Uh, probably tonight, so everybody can view this again. I know this was a very fast-paced class. I would expect if you if this is a new topic for you, you probably want to listen to it at least once more. And maybe I'll see you sign up for the residential design uh, course that I have available on my site. If you're interested in that, you just go to hvacproblog.com and click on courses. Um, so it looks like I have a couple people chiming in here at the end. Uh, Kevin Breen says he took the class in person, and um, now he's taking it online. Great, I'm glad you followed up with online. Maybe I went too fast in person. Um, Jim said, great job, I really appreciate it, Jim. It was nice seeing you not too long ago. Hopefully we can catch up again. Next time I'll look a lot younger, I'll shave all these gray hairs off, they're coming in fast. Um, any other questions before I close this out for everybody? No? I see some head shaking, no. Either I really confused everyone or I put everyone to sleep, I don't know. I really appreciate you guys taking the time um, on a Thursday night like this. Um, hopefully everybody learned something. If there's a topic I didn't cover that you want to learn more about, shoot me an email. I don't mind. Um, I probably have a blog on it that's free anyway somewhere. Um, if you haven't signed up next week yet, next week I'm going to talk about a non-invasive way of verifying that the refrigerant charge is right. And actually I have a special guest, Jim Bergman from MeasureQuick. He's going to provide a little sanity check and tell everybody why I must be drinking too much during, the, during this uh, stay-at-home crisis in order to do this. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, hopefully I'll see you guys next week.